Hello there. Uh, so another book review uh, from your bearded reviewer. Um, and the book I'm reviewing is And What Do You Do? Uh, <laughs> and What Do You Do? Um, so this is basically a book by Norman Baker, who has written a book uh, about the royal family. And he's uh, prefaced it with What the Royal Family Don't Want You to Know. And his idea is that once you find out what the question and what do you do is often what the royal family will ask people on their walkabouts and what do you do and uh, did you come far and things like that. Uh, so he's saying that after this book, we might want to ask them and what do you do? <laughs> um, it's um, a book by Norman Baker, like I said. Norman Baker is an MP or at least was an MP for quite some years uh, and he was a Liberal Democrat MP. He starts off the book basically trying to put forward a case, um, a, a sort of neutral case about whether the royal family uh, are should be there or not or the monarch or the monarchy. But pretty much as you get into the book you realise that he's a complete anti-monarchist and um, the bottom line I would say is that when you read this book by the time you finish it you'll be an anti-monarchist and like I said, when I when I started this book, I my ideas about the royal family were that the royal family, uh, yes, they seem a bit outdated. It's it's something about Britain's past, um, but you know they're you know they've got a value in that they're probably good for tourism and and that kind of historical legacy. And I thought for that reason, ugh, you know, I don't really have many thoughts about it. After reading this book you will probably most likely come down off that fence. And I definitely would say that I have come off that the royal family are a bunch of freeloading scroungers. That is basically what you come down off this. The cost of the royal family is stupendous. And I know, by the way, I'm writing this book, I'm writing this review, uh, rather doing this review, at the time when Prince Philip has just died at the age of 99. So there probably is a lot of sympathy uh, for the monarchy at the moment. Um, also, there's, you know, a lot of respect for the Queen. Uh, the Queen, of course, is a trillionaire. And when we look at some of her, uh, her fortune, uh, one of the, I mean, it's packed. This book is packed full of... Um, details that you just wouldn't know about. For example, in the P Queen's private art collection, which must be in the, you know, in the billions easily. But um, she has a collection of 500 pictures of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, these, uh, they're, they're not pictures, they're drawings uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. Just those drawings themselves amount to something like about 5 billion pounds and that's just one thing um the amount of people that i've seen i can only call it brown nosing since the death of prince philip is incredible the amount of brown nosing sycophancy is almost nauseating when you read this you will kind of realize in fact uh that those that those those people that brown nose really want to slide themselves up that greasy pole and it's and it's actually quite sad um because ultimately the what the monarchy represents is that you have to be a certain type of genetic person to get to the top in britain you have to be white you have to be protestant uh pretty much so uh, otherwise you're not going to get you cannot be part of that top table so forget the fact that you're uh, black brown um, Muslim, Hindu, um, maybe uh, even Catholic. Uh, although that, you might get a kind of look in if you marry the right person. Uh, Jewish, forget it. Um, yes, you might be in the background doing stuff, but you can't be seen on that balcony. And look at this balcony. There's about 44 members of the royal family on that. 44. Um... Most of these people are getting paid from um, what's called, there's an actual sovereign's list, I think, 
or a sovereign's uh, grant fund, uh, which has now replaced the civil list. And s re replacing that civil list meant that the royal family got much, much more suddenly than they did originally. In, in terms of their finances, I mean, I've got, a, I made a few notes and there's things about the royal family that are just incredible. Um, so for a start, the, the British royal family is the most expensive royal family in the world, in, in, in Europe. Um, we pay something like 82 million for the royal family. Uh, the Netherlands is the ne least the next expensive, and they pay half of that, which is forty million. Spain only pays seven million pounds for its um its royal family. Sweden pays six million pounds, and Liechtenstein pays almost zero. I could fund the Liechtenstein um royal family. <laughs> so there you go, um. Spain, Holland and Denmark, their royal families have two palaces apiece. The UK's royal family has uh, 15 residencies as well as Sandringham and Balmoral, which are actually their private residencies. And now things like Frogmore Palace, I think it was something like about 20, 30 million at least that was spent on just refurbishing it. And of course, uh, Meghan and Harry didn't actually stay there, they moved on, and that building has just been left, um, uh, you know, and that's just, 20 million, by the way, is small potatoes when we're talking about the royal family. Simply their security bill is 100 million a year. Um, and I, I always thought, you know, oh, the royal family has, uh, you know, it's good value for money because of the trade deals they do around the world. When you read this, you realize that's all to complete bollocks. It's rubbish. Um, they're not good value for money at all. Uh, for example, in fact, Prince Andrew actually messes up more than he probably actually does. Um, the, what is it? Uh, and, and as for the argument about tourism, well, interestingly enough, the one palace in Europe that has the most tourists in the, uh, 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 per year is actually the, the, um, the, the palace in Versailles. And uh, France got rid of its monarchy back in 1848. So that idea doesn't even follow. Uh, Buckingham Palace actually did open up some parts of itself to the public. But again, uh, that meant that they were able to put in a huge amount of a refurbishment bill. And I think it's just a few parts of the palace that opened up anyway. Um, in, you know other other things that the that the book does is doesn't just talk about the money side of it. There is the idea about how the royal family they do not just stay as a symbolic thing. They are heavily involved in the laws that are enacted. Some laws don't even get put forward because the queen has to and the royal family has to kind of rubber stamp, uh, not rubber stamp, but they have to uh, sort of screen these laws beforehand. So there are some laws that don't even get to the Houses of Parliament. Uh, other things, uh, other other laws are rubber stamped. And, you know, it doesn't matter what the Queen thinks. She just rubber stamps them. So, but many other things, many other laws uh, and things are put through things like the Privy Council. So they're discussed in this Privy Council, private council, which then, um, you know, we, we know nothing about. Um there's a there's a good bit in the book where they talk about um they, they they talk about these double standards and it's that tradition is valued and defended except when it is inconvenient whereupon it is jettisoned and new rules are made up as they go along to fashion the desired outcome. In other words, the royal family keeps the bits it likes and gets rid of the bits it doesn't like. Um, and really, it's all about self-preservation. Um, so, you know, they were, for example, you know, um, it even applies to what they name themselves. Of course, uh, I didn't understand the whole German connection. Um, before 1917, the royal family was called saxe coburg gotha That was their German name. And Louis, suddenly, after 1917, uh, they became the House of Windsor. Uh, Louis Battenberg became... Louis Mountbatten. Um, 
And a lot is written about the German connection, if you didn't understand. Um, I didn't understand. Uh, I once had an argument with a, with a cousin who went on about the Nazi connection, and I thought that was complete rubbish. And then now I'm finding out about Prince Philip. His sisters were all committed Nazis. <laughs> I mean, and then there's the pictures of the Queen uh, doing the Nazi salute. Her, was it King George? Is it King George the uh, the, the the one that abdicated with uh, Edward uh, with Mrs Simpson was a complete Nazi sympathizer. He, you know they all loved that. Um, you know Hitler was quite happy with the royal family because of their connection. So there's there's a huge Nazi connection there. Uh, and but now it's been made that the Queen is almost like Vera Lynn. We will meet again. Yeah, they they were probably at some point, at one point, thinking that they might meet again under the swastika. There's definitely, um, there's definitely a huge uh, German connection there, which most people are unaware of. Most people are unaware of the connections that people that the royal families have there. Um, so, but this goes into a lot. There are new sections in this. Uh, new sections in this about uh, Prince Edward, uh, Prince Edward? Yeah, Prince Edward. Uh, Prince Andrew, sorry, not Prince Edward. Prince. Well, actually it talks about Prince Edward as well and what hash he's made up of some of his media outlets. Um, and then it goes on about Prince Edward, obviously, and the, the links with um, uh, the Epstein uh, situation. And then it'll, it goes, it has a big chapter on Meghan and uh, and Harry, so it makes a big deal of that. But again, you know, the royal family, you know, we, we, we a lot is made of Prince Harry, poor Prince Harry. He's striking out for love. He's just surviving on his mum's money, which is something like about 40, 50 million. Every single one of the royal family is a multi, multi-millionaire. The Queen is not just a multi-millionaire, she's a trillionaire. Um, let's not, let's not be taken in by the the romance of the royal family. They are not good value for money. It cost the royal, the government something like 200 million to maintain the royal family. All of this is coming from us. This is all coming from us, the taxpayers. Um, the sovereign grant replaced the civilist and it increased what was paid to them. There's another thing that I didn't know about. Much, many lands were signed over to the government um, back in the, I think, the 18th century. And the the 18th century or the 17th century? Okay, 17 something or other. Uh, but what that also meant was that the government then had to fit the bill for the civil service, the armed forces, all that kind of stuff. Just recently, <laughs> in, the, in the chancellorship of George Osborne, 25% was given back to the royal family. 25%. Without the expenses, just imagine that. It's it's you you can't make this stuff up. Um, there's um, and then the amazing thing is these trillionaires are incredibly mean. They're incredibly mean to their own staff. People like when royal members die, a lot of these staff members are kind of packed off without even a pension, a proper pension. It's really quite amazing. We talk about celebrities wanting to get things on the free. These people are on another level. Um, what else did I... I made a few things. I mean, basically at the end, the book comes out with the idea that, yes, okay, there are people who are Republicans who want a republic and get rid of the monarchy completely. And they're the people who love the monarchy. But I suspect most people that love the monarchy have never really thought about what the monarchy costs, about what it actually does for for us and how it's treated with the... But how the press treats it and the, the kind of... The, the, the kind of ideas that they... The, the way that the press treats the monarchy. So I think those are the two things. What this guy actually advocates is that the monarchy is so intertwined in so many parts of life in Britain that perhaps what we need now is a slim down monarchy, uh, what they call a, a bicycling monarchy, like they have in Europe, where there are maybe four or five royal members and the rest actually have jobs like everybody else. 
They don't have substantial lists. And, you know, they maybe have two palaces and that's it. And that they have a kind of more defined role, uh, which makes more sense for those people that that really can't stand the, the idea of the monarchy. That may be the way to go. Incidentally, they said that Prince Charles for a long, long time advocated the idea of a slimmed down monarchy. Um, and that everybody and that the monarch should step down after the age of 70. He advocated that for a long time. Guess what? Except when he got to 70, then suddenly he changed his mind. So he changed his mind and now doesn't argue for that. So <laughs> isn't that funny? Isn't that a coincidence? So really, after you read this, I would really recommend getting this. If you live in Britain, what the royal family don't want you to know, and what do you do? by Norman Baker, you must read this. If you have any sense of decency and integrity in you, you must look at what the royal family really represents and what it actually means for the rest of society in Britain. I think despite anything I say or this guy says, the more people that actually find out about the royal, about the monarchy, and it, 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 der it derives its power from secrecy, from people not knowing what's really going on and not really looking into it and just thinking it's all about the weddings and the pomp and the ceremony. All of that costs money, huge amounts of money. There's much, much more behind that. And I think I've probably only scratched the surface by reading this book, but I would say that this is a good one to get um, and it will, it will give you, it will show you that we don't have to have a monarchy like we have in Britain. Other countries have monarchies. Japan has... Uh, the, the oldest monarchy in the world. Um, I certainly hate the monarchy in Saudi Arabia. It's a disgrace to to any religious uh, ideas there and what they can get away with. But the monarchy in Britain is just... I mean, oh God, I'm looking at this photo and I can see Prince Andrew and the rest with all their medals. They're literally falling off their shirts. For what? Yes, They've done a service. They've done. Uh, they've done their stint in the Falklands. They've done their stint, whatever. But so have loads and loads of other people. They don't have as many medals as this. It's 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 actually obscene. It's actually obscene what they get to, um, and even for the soap opera value, it's it's just it's just so incredibly expensive. And I can understand why someone like Meghan Markle thought to heck with this. I'm getting out of here. How long? Um, he will last, I don't know, Harry, uh, outside of that milieu. Because I can understand if you're in that milieu where, you know, it, it is another level that you probably... Entitlement isn't even the word. It's on another level. And I can understand... I can understand why they want to keep it. Uh, but that what I, I come out at the end of this is thinking, why do we want to keep this? Why do we want to stand for this? So this is, I think, a great book to read. If you live in Britain, you've really got to read this. And I think if you want to know about um, the way monarchies can end up, I think you've got to read a book like this. Really useful. And what do and what do you do? Uh, by Norman Baker. Uh, get it. Okay, take care. Bye.